Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. Yeah, 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 yeah. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we protect your brain with weird and wonderful science. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this special airborne edition, Part 2 of Professor Jose Luis Jimenez explaining about the resistance of medical authorities to the reality of COVID-19 as an airborne disease that spreads like smoke. And how hygiene theatre should be replaced by air conditioner filters and better ventilation. Jose Luis Jimenez is a professor of chemistry and environmental sciences at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He's been a champion of the fact that COVID-19 spreads like smoke, through air exhaled by some infected people, just like influenza, tuberculosis, smallpox, measles and mumps. I spoke with him by Zoom and continued by asking him, why do you think in medical authority culture there's such a resistance to people changing their minds? Do you think it's connected with the way we train people in medicine? I think there are several reasons. One is this history. I mean, they, they really believe that and this contact infection, I mean, or these concepts w- worked pretty well. We didn't have any big pandemics. We were able to eradicate the smallpox, for example, even though we think it was probably an airborne disease, but it just wasn't very contagious. And the people who were infectious were the people who were very sick. You know, so it wasn't very hard to isolate them, contact trace them, vaccinate and we so, from their point of view, this idea of droplet infection has been pretty successful. And so I think, and, and really going back, it's, it's not like it's a 20-year-old theory. It's like, to them, it's like, if this is so proven, even though even though then you go back and look at, it was a hypothesis without any proof. And actually, when you look at the literature, so it didn't have any evidence in 1910. And actually, there's a paper in 2020 by Professor Hugo Liu of the University of Hong Kong where he reviews the literature and he says, droplet infection has never been demonstrated directly for any disease. So, so it's like, this is a dogma that WHO immediately says this is a droplet disease, but it was a hypothesis without evidence. And to, to, to today's, we don't have evidence, not just for COVID, for any disease, but something, but it looks enough, it, 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 can, it, it can approximate enough of what happens with, with a real airborne infection that it has really been believed. Then there is there is other reasons that for the same, as I was explaining earlier, that, that Chapin found that airborne infection just caused too much fear and then, then you couldn't people wouldn't defend themselves and whatever. And, and the same thing was told by us by WHO when we met with them is that airborne would cause too much fear and panic and then healthcare workers wouldn't want to go to the hospital and, and there were not enough N95 masks and you know things of this ilk. WHO has known at least since November. In November, they said that ventilation was very important to you know, Maria Van Karhoven, Maria Neira, who are two number threes at the WHO basically you know, said ventilation is very important and started to give numbers. They are smart and they know ventilation only matters for an airborne pathogen. A projectile doesn't care if you have ventilation. So they have been admitting it. And actually in, in, in an article that was published today that interviewed Maria Van Karhoven, she admits that they knew it was airborne, but that they didn't want to say it because they thought it would be too scary, too confusing. So, I mean, I think there's been also resistance. But the, the problem is that then if you don't say it, especially because the 20th of March, they send a very clear message that with an all caps tweet and a message, fact, this is not airborne. And saying that it's airborne is misinformation. And we have to help WHO fight this misinformation that people are saying it's airborne. And that everyone heard that and that the virus was through surfaces and everyone started disinfecting their shopping and things like that and not doing anything for the air because it's not in the air. So when when myself and other scientists have been talking to people in many countries saying, you know, you have to ventilate, whatever they say, but why? It's not in the air. It's not important, right? And even just less than a month ago, I was talking to a journalist in the Philippines and and you know about ventilation and measuring CO2. And, and he said, you know, I'm interviewing the local experts and they say, this is crazy. They think 
they they say you know this CO2 measuring CO2 has no purpose and ventilation doesn't help because the virus is not in the air, and and the local representative of WHO was more or less saying that now so they can interview me but I cannot outcompete the establishment right now the day that on April 30th WHO admitted it was partially airborne. Two days later, the journalist, the Filipino journalist, writes to me and say, you know what? The experts say now, yeah, yeah, it is partially airborne. <laughs> because basically the, the way WHO, I mean, WHO is kind of the health ministry of, of, of half the world, you know, that doesn't have. And the way it works in a lot of the world is, is that it is an intellectual dictatorship. That's not what they intend. And they tell me they're horrified when I say this, but it's the way it works. It's the way the world works. When they say something and they have access to all these experts and all these scientists and whatever, and the health ministry in the Philippines, in Panama, in Chile, in Spain, in, in most countries, is just going to take what they say because they just don't have the ability or the confidence to, to say otherwise, right? And if, if a politician or someone wants to go further than WHO, it's difficult to justify because there's people who are going to say, oh, too many restrictions. And if they don't want to do any more, they can hide behind WHO. They have an enormous influence, you know, and, they, and they've been extraordinarily stubborn about about admitting just that this is mainly an airborne pathogen. It's quite amazing. Like, for example, do you think there's some, some politics there for the locals that it's very visible theatre to go to a lot of trouble to visibly decontaminate a service, to spray your antiseptic? Like, in Sydney, on our public transport trains, we have people going around all day spraying the surfaces and wiping them down. But... If you were to put proper filters in the air conditioning on the trains, people wouldn't see that. So maybe the politicians want to be seen to be doing something. Do you think there's a contribution there? Yeah, yeah. Hygiene theatre, right? They, they want to... People are very nervous and they're questioning the actions of the politicians and then the politicians want to be seen doing something and, and this cleaning is, is highly visible, right? We call it hygiene theatre. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate and, and then... In, in some countries, they were saying, well, we're doing it because we saw the Chinese were doing it. And I was like, yeah, the Chinese also have politicians who also need to show their very nervous population that they're doing something. And they were going with, I mean, the, the worst of it all is, is when all these trucks that, I mean, I'm sure there is thousands of trucks around the world that have gone around spraying disinfectant outdoors. Outdoors, there is no transmission. And the, the light of the sun kills the virus very quickly on surfaces. And, and, and surfaces don't transmit anyway. It's just so absurd. And you're polluting the outdoors with bleach and, and and stuff like that. But yet this has been very popular. I mean, at some point there was a some local government in Spain who bought a full page ad and, and they had all the pictures about how they, their municipality was rated as one of the best in Spain for um, for dealing with the virus. And all the pictures were the truck disinfecting the outdoors, right? And And they were very proud of this. And they spent thousands of dollars in this ad when, you know, with those thousands of dollars, they could have bought a CO2 detector for each school in the town, right? But, but that wasn't, the, they believed, the, you know, this was a better use of the money. It's quite amazing. I think there's, there seems to be a reluctance to want to also change. Like, at the beginning of the pandemic, all of the things that we were told to do were mainly for the, the droplet idea, but it was, was that sort of thing that you had to worry about. And they told us not to wear masks because they knew that masks would work, but they were worried that we'd all run out of masks for the essential workers. So they did the neoliberal sort of lying because they know better than the public. And now you're telling me that they're sort of saying, well, if we told people it was in the air, they'd panic, so we have to lie to them again. But it also seems there's a reluctance to change preparations that they've... They've got these things in place and they, they don't want to change. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's also the case. I mean, they, because for a lot of politicians and, you know, they, it's all very distant to them, you know, they, and if they're doing something and they have it under control and they're paying certain people and whatever, now you have to change, it's a lot of work and then. And then people may miss the hygiene theater. I mean, I've, I've heard from people when they like they disinfected less, and people complained very loudly, you know, that that this wasn't safe because they were not disinfecting, you know. So, so the, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, you see, you can almost do a study of the flow of information around the world. 
And of course, we are all much more impressionable at the beginning, right? The virus appeared in March. We were all stunned by the rapid spread of the pandemic. And then they tell us with certainty, fact is not in the air, is on these droplets on the surfaces. It, that was engraved on every one of our brains. And I was the first one who was disinfecting all the groceries. And, <laughs> and we have still all these disinfectants that we bought just in case we needed to keep doing this for a while, right? But... I mean, even after we have explained you know, that surfaces don't transmit and, and, you know, the CDC says this and nature has policies, but many people will, will comment in Twitter. It's like, yeah, I know, but I just can't stop. It's, it's just because they put the fear of God in, 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 in ourselves. We all have PTSD and we see a surface and we kind of see the virus. It's, it's, it's become emotional, an emotional connection by now. It's not, it's not rational anymore, right? Yes. While the air, the air has come later and it has come with this constantly being disputed and the scientists say this is the, and CDC has never said it clearly and WHO has never said it clearly and, and governments like in Australia, they deny it and Spain drag their feet and most governments have been yeah, not, not wanting to admit it, dragging their feet, whatever. whatever. So then the message hasn't arrived. It has flowed slowly through governments and then more to local governments or to companies like the subway or whatever. And more so to the local school and the individual people, right? I mean, this is just very, very delayed and very slow. You're listening to Ian Wolf on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. So I was a bit puzzled at the beginning of the pandemic when they came out with different social distancing distances in different countries. So you've got (laughs) two metres in some countries, one and a half metres in the other countries. Britain only had one metre. And some seem to have none at all. And all of that was based on the droplet theory, which obviously isn't right. With concentrations of aerosols being different, the, the different distances you are, if you're indoors or even outdoors, what social distancing would an aerosol understanding of COVID tell us to take? Let me explain. I mean, the, why the public health people say different distances in different countries depends on what is feasible. So what WHO people said, if we say it's two meters, then in India, that's not feasible in many situations. And then they'll just ignore distance. But if we say one meter, then that's that's still very beneficial compared to being closer. So that's useful. And then a local government can say more. You know, if if, if a larger distance is feasible, then you can you can do more. Now, what's the reality? So the reality, imagine someone is exhaling smoke, like cigarette smoke. That's what aerosols do. And they do a different thing in every situation, right? If you are outdoors in a windy day, they go away very quickly. In a cold day, they may rise because they're warmer than the environment. If the wind is is going from the smoker to you, you know, maybe two meters is not enough because you are unlucky, right? And indoors is something similar. Again, depends what the the ventilation flow is is in that place. So you may get you may get some direct flow, or otherwise the smoke will mix in the room and you will end up inhaling it, but after it has been diluted in the room, right? So distance is the, the more the merrier within the limit of what's possible, right? That's, mm. that's generally what, what we should do. You mentioned on your Twitter thread that some of this sort of reluctance in the scientific community to accept new ideas and new evidence goes all the way back to the very famous case of the pump handle and cholera. I mean, I guess that that's even broader than, than urban transmission, how a disease is transmitted is something difficult to determine, right? Because you get you fall ill with some disease and anything you did on the week before maybe could have led to the disease, right? People are drinking water and breathing the air and being talking to other people and, and touching things. And so it has always been throughout history a controversial topic of how diseases were transmitted. And and theories get established and then everyone thinks it happens that way. And then, much like the inertia displayed by WHO and health ministries now, we can imagine that it wasn't any easier in 1850 or, or, or in previous times, right? So when John Snow shows that he removes the pump handle and, and the cholera goes away, and then he finds a case 
where someone had died of cholera and her son had brought water from that particular pump. And, you know, so there is some pieces of evidence that are pretty damning. But the Board of Health in London said that this that they saw no reason to believe the water was the culprit and that these were mere suggestions, you know. So they so and they resisted it for, for a long time. And in fact, John Snow died before it was accepted. And the same happened, for example, with Ignat Semmelweis, who was a doctor who showed that if the if doctors washed their hands with chlorine before delivering babies, there were a lot of less babies who would die than of what they call childbed fever. And again, he was, you know, his colleagues were very resentful that he was saying they were hurting the kids by not washing their hands, even though that was true. They were actually hurting them and causing some of them to die. But he was basically run out of Vienna and and was harassed so much that he had a breakdown. He was interned in a mental hospital. He was beaten and then died of an infection without his theory not having been accepted, right? These are two things now that, that we take for granted, of course, and transmission through through the hands of some of some bacteria or, or transmission through water right so airborne transmission was similarly resisted it's just that it, it's probably the, the of the all the transmission is the most difficult to prove because it has this overlap with this with these droplets and, and maybe that's why it has been resisted so much you've mentioned about stronger fitting and better masks and about filters and ventilation as an aerosol infectious disease expert, what changes would you like to see governments make now that it's more accepted that it's an aerosol spread disease to stop the spread of COVID? The most important thing we can do is explain it to people. Because once you explain it to people, then they know what to do. I've talked to people in India months ago and they and they were we, were, we were trying to say, what do we do? And, and they were describing houses, which are very different, and I haven't been there. So we were having some trouble communicating. But then I told them, look, think that it is like smoke. What would you do in your situation so you don't breathe the smoke that other people are exhaling if everyone was exhaling smoke? And then they were like, oh, we understand. And then they never asked me again because they, they had now something useful to work with, right? So I think we need to explain to people that out of some infected, not everyone, but only some of the infected, comes this invisible smoke that behaves just like cigarette smoke, and we get infected when we breathe a lot of it. Not just a little, but when we breathe a lot, either because we're close to someone, or we're sharing the same room for a long time, especially with low ventilation, or under more difficult circumstances if we are unlucky and and it reaches us by a longer distance, right? So that's the most important. And then then what becomes obvious is, okay, the, the most useful thing is to do everything outdoors that we can. So any family, personal, work meeting, school, whatever can be done outdoors, do it outdoors. I mean, we know that transmission is at least 20 times less likely, although there is a study in Ireland now with contact tracing where they found that it was a thousand times less likely. You know, so, so it's some very large number. Outdoors is so much more, so much safer that in a lot of places, you know, during some days, some of the day we can do things outdoors. Let's do that. And that's free, right? Then, you know, we have to go indoors in, in places that, where we have COVID, where we should go as little as possible for as short time as possible with a, as few people as possible. But then, we, you know, we have to, to spend some time there. Then we should always wear good masks, masks of good quality that fit well to our face, that they leave a mark on our face because they've been tight against our face and they cannot be worn on top of a beard because then they don't seal. So we have to kind of explain better the quality of masks and and regulate that better and and kind of encourage these elastomeric half masks that works you so much better. And they are not that costly compared to the cost of the pandemic. I mean, most countries could have gifted uh, a really good mask to each one of their citizens by a cost that's, that's a tiny fraction of what they have lost economically to the pandemic. And then we need to ventilate, you know, we're going to spend time indoors. We should take some of the air that's indoors and put it outdoors and bring outside air, which can be just opening the windows and um, or use the systems, you know, systems with, with conduits con- if we have them. And then if we cannot ventilate because it's a basement or it's too noisy, too cold, too polluted, then we have to filter. Filters are uh, old technology, doesn't have any side effects, you know, you just capture the aerosols from the air and it works really well and, and the cost is, is limited, right? So that's that's what we should do. And 
also realize that vocalization puts a lot more virus in the air. So, so especially we should be careful and always wear masks if we're talking or especially we're shouting or singing. And in places like a bar, you want to remove the music so that people don't have to shout and put much more virus in the air, right? And indeed, we see a lot of outbreaks in, in bars, in restaurants, in choirs, and in gyms, which are places where people are just talking harder or breathing harder, right? And we don't see outbreaks in movie theaters or in libraries where people are quiet, right? Because they are just maybe putting 10 or 50 less times virus in the air. And now we should avoid, there, there has been, you know, with this idea that the, the, uh, the virus is in the air, all these air cleaners. And as I was saying, there is, there is filters that work very well. There is germicidal ultraviolet, which, which works and can destroy the virus. But if you do it properly, it's more expensive and more complicated. So it should be done in places like maybe prisons or, you know, the emergency room, waiting room, or, you know, places that, that the expense is justified and maybe adding filters is not practical. And then we should avoid, uh, I'm a professor of chemistry, and I'm going to tell you, we should avoid anything that tries to do chemistry of the virus, that tries, tries to kill the virus through chemistry, right? Because this can be done, you can put chemicals in the air that would react with the virus and, and destroy it, but then they have two problems. One is that they may react with the virus chemically and damage the proteins, nucleic acid, or lipids that constitute the virus. But what is a respiratory system and our eyes made of? Lipids, nucleic acids, and and proteins. So, so those chemicals are also going to be dangerous for us. As well as in indoor air, there is a lot of a lot of pollutants that come out of the materials that buildings are made of or the consumer products that we use, cleaners, shampoos, everything, as well as used from, from our breath and from us. And these chemicals that we are trying to use to clean the air also react with those pollutants indoors and they turn them into more toxic forms. So, and there is two types. There is what they call electronic air cleaners using ions, photocatalysis, plasmas, hydroxyls. And then there is just what they call foggers or, or just spraying chemicals directly in the air, like either with ozone or with hypochlorous acid, which is bleach basically, or chlorine dioxide, which is an industrial bleach, or hydrogen peroxide or alcohol. And all of this is a really bad idea. We should use, as I said, ventilate and filter and maybe UV and avoid all these other things that, that are unproven, most of them, and, and most likely dangerous. Well, it's an amazing story with so many interesting things that people just really should have known and we didn't understand. So thank you very much for telling us all about that. Okay, thank you very much for listening. That was the second and final part of my discussion with Professor Jose Luis Jimenez from the University of Colorado in Boulder in the USA about the airborne spread of COVID-19 by aerosols. Hygiene theatre is a waste of time. You don't need to constantly disinfect trains, buses and your groceries. You don't need to obsess about touching your face, but washing your hands protects you against other diseases like gastroenteritis. COVID-19, like flu, spreads through exhaled hair like smoke. So the solution is ventilation and filtration and choosing to be outside when we can. Listen next week when Professor Matthew Rimmer explains how the battle over COVID-19 patents reflects a wider problem in the pharmaceutical industry and how it's stopping empty vaccine factories in Canada and around the world from being used to save lives. Our body is just like a little country that has been invaded by an enemy army. But the enemy in this case is not big soldiers. This invading army is so tiny that it can be seen only through a microscope. Its soldiers are the germs of communicable disease. Some of these disease-causing organisms are so small that they cannot be seen even with the most powerful microscope. We can do much to prevent the spread of disease by keeping away from those who are sick. Common sense tells us to stay away from indoor crowds whenever communicable diseases are prevalent. Some diseases, such as smallpox, diphtheria, and typhoid fever could be wiped out entirely if each and every one of us took advantage of the time-proof protection offered by vaccination and preventive inoculation. Every step we take to prevent the spread of disease means increased happiness and greater living efficiency for all of us. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. 
Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolfe. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 NVR in Nambucca Valley, 3 NBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7 LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2 FM in Canberra. Diffusion is narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in northeast Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords, so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf, or join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography, collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.